Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining for another live chat. Um, today we have a very special guest, her name is Sarah Begum. She is a TV presenter as well as an explorer. <clears throat> um, Sarah ha is also a member of the Royal Geographical Society. She's also an investigative journalist and an anthropologist. Um, as I said, Sarah is an avid explorer. She has also been exploring the world and living and studying with different tribes um, while also trying to make a humanitarian effort to make these people's lives better. Um, Sarah has also been featured in my film that I just did about Nefertari, where Sarah investigated uh, Nefertari's role as the God's wife of Amun. So, yeah. Let me see here if Sarah is on. All about Sarah's travels. Hey! And... <laughs> How are you? I'm really good. How are you? I'm great. So nice to see you. You look lovely. Thank you. So do you. <laughs> Thank you. I see we're matching. I, we're always matching. <laughs> I'm going, to, I'm going to provide you good lighting, so just bear with me. <laughs> <laughs> we secretly planned this, this, this matching, didn't we? Yes, we did. We're just aligned somehow. Tele telepathically somehow. <laughs> 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 so I just, I just gave a, a quick introduction for everyone watching about a little bit about you. So I would like you to tell us more about you. Um, you have explored the world. Um, you've spent time in Egypt. What is your opinion on the female role in modern Egypt versus the ancient society? Okay, well, that's an interesting one. And when I was in Egypt, unfortunately, I was only in Cairo for a few days because of the pandemic. I couldn't really, and many other factors, I couldn't extend my stay. However, um, I stayed with an Egyptian anthropologist um, and she, she told me that things were not that, were still, things were still um, difficult for women today in comparison to the old time. Because if you think about the ancient kingdoms, women were very empowered, weren't they? They were empowered. They were. I mean, they, they had so many rights. Yeah, so many roles, and they had a lot of influence. They had a lot of power, and they used that to um, navigate various situ situations and decisions politically as well. And so yeah. I, just, I just think nowadays that's not really the case, is it? Because if you think about the God's Wife of the Moon, that role, during the ceremonies and the rituals, um, they had, the influence began, and it also ended with the ritual. So decisions were yeah. made um, and nothing like that exists today. And then that ended- I mean, uh, in ancient times, the, the viziers and the overseers, they are mainly men. Yeah. Even though women had a lot of rights, mm. a lot of decisions were still just male. Yeah, it is. And I think the ghost wife of the moon role ended um, when the Persians invaded, because that's that 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 was the last kingdom, and that since then we haven't seen or heard of anything like this, unless people are practicing it, you know, um, in minority groups um, that we haven't heard of. That it's not really widely known, is it? It's not, and you know, if you look at um, my my female Egyptian friends, they are very strong women. Yeah. I think it's, it's continued. Um, yes, there's certain political things for them that are not great. But from what I've noticed in Egypt compared to other countries, when a woman speaks up in Egypt, mm. they, they do listen. Yeah. Hi. My friend Dahlia, I mean... If someone was giving her shit, she just started screaming and like, they left us alone, so. Well, the thing is they can do that, but in terms of decision making, I have Egyptian friends who are very strong as well. Very strong, amazing, inspiring, beautiful women. 
But in yes. terms of influence, um, high level decision making, there aren't that many. There's only very few. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Mm. It's more, I think, more in antiquity circles where the women get a bit more of a say, like at a museum being a director or a curator. Yeah. Um, yeah. It would be nice to see, like, Madame Sadat taking a political yeah. role. <laughs> yeah, because that's how you influence and govern countries and impact the lives of people, essentially. Yeah. yeah. And how do you feel that women's roles and rights relate to other women around the world? I mean, you've spent time in the Amazon and with the Berbers and many tribes. How, did, how do you feel mixing with them? What did you learn? Okay. That's that's an interesting question, because in the Amazon they was they were just so strong and beautiful women. They were just they were stronger than me at the time, even the little girls. So I went on a hunting expedition with the men, and then I yeah. went to um, the chakra with the women. So another expedition to gather um, to cultivate yucca, to gather bananas and hammock leaves from deep in the jungle so we could bring it back to the village and um, strip off the fibers of the leaf, boil them, and then use them to weave hammocks and baskets. And it was, um, it was just, you know, I admired these women. They had such strength. And what they did uh, contributed to the survival of their community, of the tribe. So they had equally yeah. important roles to the men. And many years ago, they used to join the men on hunting expeditions. It's only recently that they stay at home or they go into the, you know, that they go into the jungle, but not so deep, just to gather the mm -hmm. hammock leaves and to cultivate yuccas um, and bananas because the yucca is their main source of carbohydrates. You know, what, what is a yucca? Sorry. Yucca. So yucca is a it's a vegetable. Well, it's like a potato okay. underground. Um, I had to. If you watch my Amazon Souls documentary, I cut my fingers trying to dig one out of the ground. It's quite big. <laughs> um, and then I did the same again in the Brazilian Amazon two years ago. Um, so yeah. a lot of indigenous tribes use the yucca. Um, yeah, they use the yucca as part of their primary diet. Yucca and okay. hunting for meat such as monkeys or jungle pig. Um, sometimes yeah. macaws. They used macaw feathers. They used macaw feathers to make my crown <laughs> when they made me queen. <laughs> I, I have not. I have not watched the whole documentary. I've seen okay. clips um, on your YouTube channel. Okay. So it did look very interesting. I saw you having a bath the one day as well. Oh, that was in the Brazilian <laughs> Amazon. Yeah, I needed I, I needed a bath because I was. Um, so what I did was I stayed with different indigenous tribes because this village was made up of five to seven different communities, completely different indigenous tribes, um, and I yeah. wanted to, wanted to stay with a different family in their house at every single night of the five days that I had there. No. Um, and it was very interesting because depending on how much they put in, they got out. So if they put in a lot of work um, and they had various business ideas um, which they implemented, such as ecotourism or uh, providing boat services, whatever it may be, or, or making jewellery and selling them to ecotourists, they had a lot of money. Yeah. So they would live well off and they would have money to and go out and buy frozen chickens even or they had like a freezer you know in the hut um wow i know how was it powered sorry how was it powered i mean you're in the middle of the jungle how do you get electricity exactly <laughs> so i i think it was solar powered um or they okay. had a generator for oh, each house yeah. was very different they had a generator for one of the houses. One of the houses didn't have any electricity um, or, the, the, or it was minimal. Because, but there were, the boys were sitting in the hammock 
watching YouTube, listening to Despacito <laughs> on YouTube. I was like, what? <laughs> I mean, that's the last thing you expect when you're in the Amazon. Island. I know, I know. I thought, wow, that's just something. Um, the little girl was playing with a with a Chris Hemsworth Thor toy and a Barbie, and I I just thought, okay, where did she get that from? Um, it was bizarre. It was really interesting. And then an iguana just walked into the jungle at one point, and I thought, and and the kids were playing with it. They were trying to keep it as a pet. Um, is that Jer Jared Jared Leto? <laughs> Hi, John. <laughs> I get that so often. Thank you. <laughs> He's just I see Arif also, like, he, he was asking a question there. He's like, are you two brother and sister? So. <laughs> We're like twins, aren't we? Exactly, exactly. I'm We're just a bit twins. more hairy. We're salt but... twins. Sorry? <laughs> I'm just a bit more hairy, but. Uh... I'm a little bit more salt. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, it was, um, yeah. it was fascinating. And then the final house I stayed in, the guy had a massive, he had a bed with a mattress <laughs> and a really big freezer. And, like not leaves and things piled, like an actual it mattress. Was, it, he had an actual bed with a headboard and mattress and freezer and two tvs and two different types of game consoles so i just thought oh, what and at the at the front of the house his wife was um cooking on a fire yeah so it, amanda's asking where was that oh that was in the brazilian amazon in manaus i mean that that's totally not what you picture in your mind no um, Times think of the Amazon. Times have changed. Um, there's been a lot of global influence in various communities. Um, so if you think about how the Industrial Revolution affected humanity and life, and, and we haven't really gone back, have we, since then? Um, when, I, I believe... Oh, Amanda's when, Brazilian. Sorry? <laughs> I'll call her Brazilian. Amanda says she's Brazilian. Amazing. Where in Brazil are you from? <laughs> So I think we find ways to make life easier naturally. And once you find, you know, easier ways to live, you don't necessarily go back because as yeah. a species, we continue to evolve. So yeah. we have never been, I you've never been there. <laughs> you should go. It's awesome. I love it. Lots of interesting food and drinks I can't pronounce, but tastes amazing. <laughs> Beautiful yeah. country, beautiful people and culture. South you know, like you said now to, to Amanda, you said, oh, you should go. That's, I was wondering, how did you actually get interested in exploring? Oh, um, well, growing up, I was interested in the world. My friends were from all over the world, um, different cultures, and I was always fascinated by their culture and their backgrounds. Yeah. Um, and then uh, when I was nine, I learned about, I, I've said this so many times. <laughs> I learned about deforestation in the Amazon and it was my dream to go there and save the trees and see how the tribes people lived. And I never thought that would ever happen. So I, you know, I just often would dream about it. And sometimes I heard tribes people calling me Sounds crazy, I know. <laughs> um, and then at the age of 21, I was studying television film. And I decided that, well, well, I didn't really feel like I was getting much from the course, to be honest. I was thinking, well, what happens after this? <laughs> What's next? I'm just going to be another I had that artist. same feeling. Yeah. When I was at film school, I was like, well, uh, what am I really doing here? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I just think yeah. um I just think you need to go out and do it. You have to be more proactive and I with the experience. I was, yeah, I, I was worried I was really worried about my life after the degree 
because I just didn't want to be in the same boat as everyone else. Um, yeah. And so I decided to follow my dreams and I, I quit my job. I had a job, funnily enough, my part-time job at uni. I don't think I've ever mentioned this. I used to work um, as a supervisor, supervising various collections in museums and galleries all over London. So my first one was at the, um, the British Museum and at night, like I remembered the night shift during the Terracotta Army Expedition when I'd walk through the Egyptian rooms and I thought of that movie, the, um, was it, uh, Night at the Museum with Ben Stiller? <laughs> I thought the movie was not going to come out! <laughs> this was years ago when I, when I was like 17 or 18, I can't remember. 18? 18, 18, something like that. <laughs> so your imagination was running wild. It was, it was. But um, um, I love that collection, it's my favourite. So I was always excited about going to Egypt. Anyway, so yeah, um, at the age of 21, I quit my job. I hired a cinematographer and sound man. Um, and I decided to make it happen. I used all my savings. I won an award from my university. Um, I was the only woman out of 10 guys and the only creative as well. Um, and I just, I went there. I found a tribe that I cared about, that I was excited about, who lived primitively today or at the time. Um, and I was also interested in the conflict um, they're associated with the oil because they have a large oil reserve where they are um, and I wanted to investigate that so I, I remember watching the Bruce Parry TV series on the Amazon um, and I contacted his um, I contacted his producer and his producer said oh wow well, there's no one's no one this young or like he's doing anything like this or has done something like this i'm happy to advise you on anything you need um so he advised me um helped me with my planning and yeah i went to the amazon but i was teaching english in as part of a volunteer organization just to get used to being in the jungle um, to have enough time to investigate um, into the old companies. I was in the prime, uh, the secondary jungle first, and I wanted to, you know, do something good. I wanted to give back and be part of something um, useful and valuable, you know, whilst I was there. Yeah. And... I did that. I conducted an eco fashion show with the kids. They're so smart and intelligent for their age because they've had to grow up faster than the average child here in the West. Mm -hmm. um, and I found that really interesting. They have a lot of skills that yeah. many adults in the West don't even have. No, I know. They really do. Um, yeah. And, and it's, it's, it's so beautiful to see yet sometimes it's quite sad yeah you know? i can i can see that you know um like if you visit egypt and you see also um the little kids who are working in the fields and things like that mm. and they they're not too bothered by technology or things like that they they are very happy um you know, so on the one side, you see the, the joy that they're getting. On the other side, you go, you do feel sad because you want, we want them to do other things. But they're quite happy. Yeah. They're, they're happy because they're free. Yeah. I, I think freedom gives you happiness. I think that's, that's the key. <laughs> yeah. When you're free to be yourself when you're free, when you don't have to prove yourself to anyone else, when you don't care what anyone else thinks, when, you've, mm -hmm. you're, when you're free to live the life you want to live, um, yeah. oh, even if it's not your dream life yet, if you're just free in making the decisions um, for you, not for anyone else, not to please anyone else, you know, yeah. then you're happy. Because quite often I feel people are conditioned or pressured to act 
a certain way, to be a certain way. Um, and I think that's what causes a lot of mental health issues, uh, to mm -hmm. be honest with you, you know? Um, and then- It's the, the preconceived ideas that how we should be. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. And why do you have to live up to other people's expectations when, when you can just be yourself? When you, yeah. when you can have the confidence of just being you. Yeah. I think that's a, that's a good lesson for people to learn. I used to, I used to have that mindset where I used to uh, read comments on YouTube and things like that. And I get a lot of comments on YouTube. Um, and I used to read like 10 great comments and then I'd get one really bad one. And the bad one would stick with me. And then I, I changed my thinking and I went and I said, no, I'm going to think I've got 10 versus one, 10 good versus one bad. Concentrate on the good ones. Who cares about the bad one? Exactly. Now I can read them. Now, if I get a bad comment, I can actually read it and I go, eh, whatever. I think don't, don't let those bad comments get to you. You know, I've had some weird comments as well. Um, especially from my th the Amazon documentary because there's a scene in there where I'm having to take my clothes off to be accepted into the tribe, you know. Um, internationally, different cultures view that in different ways. So mm -hmm. if you were to, as an anthropologist, understand another culture, why they have to live that way or practice the ritual that way, why it's important to them, then you wouldn't yeah. be so judgmental. So the thing that we lack today is empathy and understanding. And that's, I think that's why yeah. there's a lot of wars created, you know, egos, control, power, misunderstanding, um, and someone saying my views are right and your views are wrong, therefore you're gonna go to hell and I'm gonna go to heaven, you know? It's <laughs> or you should die and I should live, or I deserve this land and you don't. I just, I just think people need to understand each other more, widen their horizons. If you think about it, um, our size, what we are, we're, we're insignificant compared to the rest of the universe and, and on the grand scale of things. We're this, we're this tiny dot, not even that. Yeah a percentage of this tiny dot in this big universe. And so if you have a narrow mind, you're just going to be in this small constrained space. But if you can yeah. open up your mind um, and try to understand everyone and everything around you the best you can so that you live a more peaceful, happier, healthier life, then more things will open up to you. You'll start seeing life in a different way you'll start seeing different avenues you can explore different paths you can take in you know, life becomes interesting so yeah. it just look up. yeah <clears throat> i'm just going to put this <laughs> on a tripod my window so let me just there you go is your arm like breaking off <laughs> i was martial arts training this morning and boxing so my arms are already uh, <laughs> they're already a little bit now so they're all good and plank yeah. oh gosh it really works it's, it's great apples <laughs> <laughs> I've got a whole set up here I've got like lights tripod camera everything it's <laughs> and the light, you know that's what yeah Ramesses say that about Nefertari, one for whom the, the sun shines. The sun shines. Yeah, I have a beautiful relationship with the sun. Even when I'm under a tree, the sun just literally just shines on me or in my eye. It gives me light. Like, I, think I, I have that same effect with a smoke around a fire. <laughs> So yeah. <clears throat> anyway, you have actually 
traveled literally all over the place. I mean, you have a list of places you've explored that goes on for forever. Yeah. <laughs> you know, what, which place did you enjoy the most and which place was the most challenging? Um, the place that I enjoyed the most is hard because <laughs> you have different experiences in different places. Um, and yeah. so they stick with you for various reasons. Mm -hmm. I do um, obviously the Amazon changed my life so yeah. that first experience was the most memorable and most defining um, and quite recently I, I've been I've been sucked up into the stars in Jordan like the stars are just so beautiful it's canopy of stars you visited Petra as well there yeah. oh, Petra and the Wadi Ram Desert, but, but the stars in Jordan, there's something magical and special about Jordan that I fell in love with. And, and just the star. What's his name? Hey. Hi, Abby. He's so cute. Oh, he does this when I'm on a live chat. He comes and sits next to me, and then, like, if I don't stop touching him, he's like, I need to do something. So, yeah. <laughs> Sounds like a dog. As you were saying. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I love, um, I really love Jordan. It was amazing. Petra is beautiful. And yeah. I walked into, I remember walking into um, a, in the middle of the desert. And they showed me how to milk sheep and goat, um, and they offered you know, bread and tea, and that was really nice. Uh, yeah. I I really love the Atlas Mountains in Morocco because I was adopted by a woman from the Berber tribe there, and I returned. How long did you spend with the with the Berbers in Morocco? I was there for a few months, so I between Marrakesh. In Eureka Valley, the Atlas Mountains. So sometimes I had this, you know, beautiful Riyadh apartment in Marrakesh as my home. And other times I was on top of a mountain in this beautiful Casper Hotel with the, you know, surrounded by the Berber tribe at the bottom um, at the foothill of the mountains. So it was, it was a very interesting time. <laughs> but when I would, when, whenever I'd go there, I would, I, I used to love spending time with others. They were just beautiful people and just walking in the mountains. That was my favorite thing to do. I just love yeah. There's something magical about those mountains. And I'd never forget this, but I felt my heart literally break as I drove out of the mountains, not knowing when I'd return. Um, and that was the last time I was there. It was just, it just had this effect on me, you know, this powerful effect on me yeah it's incredible it's it's weird how sometimes you travel and you leave a place and you have this feeling of sadness when you yeah. leave i mean i just feel nature understands it, it speaks to me somehow i just feel so connected to nature but i just love yeah. it um yeah but most recently obviously i love egypt i love egypt but i just wish I had more than four or five days in Cairo because it happened just before the pandemic. So I was like, shit, how am I going to make it back to London? Um, I did love Egypt and I felt something. It was really interesting. When I... Um, when, you, when you go to Egypt and you stay longer, mm. um, you have to obviously go to Aswan. And I'm telling you, you will love Aswan. You I will not want to leave. I really want to go to Aswan. I've got a question from Miss Vitamin C. Hello. <laughs> do either of you experience deja vu when you travel to these places? Yes, I do. Funny, I can tell you those stories, actually. They're kind of freaky. <laughs> They're kind of freaky. I think, Curtis, you know about them. You know about some of them. We spoke about, when we were planning the Nefertari documentary, we went off course and started talking about this. So, yes, yes. Yeah. Tell them. When I was, it was the most significant adventure for me. That was like a solo adventure throughout Mesopotamia. Um, and when I was in Istanbul, after 
looked at the artifact, the ancient holy artifact uh, in the Topkapi Palace. So I, I was looking at Moses' staff and Joseph's turban and Muhammad's beard and sword and Jesus' sword as well, I think. And just all these artifacts from the prophets and, and the um, and the saints. And, you know, I don't want to... Yeah. And all these other people. Um, I felt so... Impressed. Ancient people. <laughs> I don't want to upset anyone. Ancient people. Um, so I walked out and I was just thinking, I wonder what life was like back then. And in this palace. And then a woman walked up to me. And she just came up to me and she said, excuse me, hello, how are you? And I was like, I'm good. Hi. <laughs> I hope you. She's like, oh, um, what's going on? <laughs> yeah, yeah. She just said, I'm so sorry, but I have to tell you this. Um, I'm I'm a psychic medium when I'm not a guide here, and I just saw in my vision that you're an ancient queen or princess from a past life. I was like, what? Yeah. <laughs> I just said to her, Do you mind if I film this? <laughs> No one's gonna believe me. <laughs> <laughs> so I I filmed it, um, and that's it's on my it's on my um, YouTube and Instagram. But I wondered what you know. I I kept wondering who was she referring to or what did she see because I started feeling things. Like I I became a bit more spiritual. Um, that was my last year. I went through a transformation. Now, I started meditating like and having more visions and this is gonna sound crazy but do you know Reiki you know Reiki yeah yeah okay so you do know Reiki so I started getting all the like starting feeling things and energy and stuff and um, yeah I, I started I, I have some powers I have some healing powers so it was like yeah. Now what's going to happen? My my life is like a sci-fi movie. This is weird. <laughs> you know? But like like we were chatting about it, and you, we were talking about when this the psychic came up to you and said that you were a, like a warrior queen. Yeah, yeah, queen. Um, like, and she said, um, and she was like saying, "I'm picturing the desert and this and this and this." Yeah, and, my and I was thinking. I was thinking about it and we spoke and I was like, maybe she's referring to like Cleopatra's sister, Arsinoe. Oh yeah, we had this conversation and you helped me yeah. with that happened, yeah. Because I felt- Because you said you had a strong connection when you went to Rome and you saw, um, was it Rome? Yeah, Rome, Julius, Julius Caesar's grave. I don't know why, This I was in Rome quite a few years ago. Um, I think about eight years ago. Standing outside Julius Caesar's grave, and I started crying. I literally flooded tears, and I thought, "This is odd. What's happening to me?" I just started crying, yeah. like so, so much, like loudly, and I and I didn't understand why. I was thinking, "This is crazy. <laughs> What's going on with me? Is there any?" It happens. There are. Yeah. It's I. It's like. I don't know what you want to call it, but these things do happen. You have special feelings and connections. And if this woman was right, this feeling that you got from his tomb is totally, totally relevant. It, yeah, because her life was, you know, she, she was the rebel queen. Arsinoe, mm -hmm. rebel queen. Yeah. And Cleopatra yeah. didn't want her to take the she had the right to the throne so she had her murdered by Mark Antony and Julius Caesar the one who spared her life um, and she was sent away yeah yeah so to Turkey so. And, and I kind of relate to her after what I told you about mm -hmm. um, so yeah that was interesting to to make friends. and I had been researching her a lot more and it was just, you know, even her body, there's, there's a sculpture of her in one of the museums. It's actually a carbon copy of my body. That's exactly what it is. Well, I look like, <laughs> I don't 
underneath my clothes. <laughs> but it was bizarre. It was so, <laughs> you know. Um, the only yeah. carbon copy I can find around is literally my nose on Ramsey's. Yeah, <laughs> you do look like Ramsey's. <laughs> it's just the nose. <laughs> no, it, you have this ancient Egyptian energy, you know, like this, <laughs> this. But I, I wore this for you today. Oh, I don't know if you can I, see it. Like, oh wow! <laughs> I wore this. It's it's Julius Caesar. So that's so cool. This is um, this was handcrafted by an Egyptian jewelry designer. Um, and obviously, you know, it's so beautiful. The ankh uh, ankh symbols, which means life. Yeah. The turquoise. You know that the. Mm -hmm in their jewelry um, and then this is Isis the Queen Isis with the yeah. actually no in the middle there let me tell you what that is what is that um, Isis okay so that is the god Shu mm -hmm. um, who lived between Geb and Nut Geb is the god of the earth uh -huh. Nut is the god of the sky and Shu separated them because Geb and Nut were, were fighting too much. So Shu is atmosphere. Oh, wow. And when Shu is also sometimes shown holding two Ankhs, it is a symbol of the Hecate and Shu, which basically is the god of eternity. Oh, so why did she tell me it was Isis? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's, it's a little more of a connection to eternity which i think is quite nice okay. um i also have a necklace of that and i gave two friends of mine uh, matching necklaces so all three of us match that's um that's really beautiful. yeah but also the turquoise there is connected to the goddess hathor yes um goddess of love and music um which would have been found in sinai i love music so <laughs> and i yeah. love that's great <laughs> there we go but um, where were we? Oh, yeah. So she was asking about deja vu. My deja vu that I get is if I walk into Egypt somehow. So I don't know. Sometimes I know information that I don't remember reading. Oh, I get that too. So yeah, like you're walking around and you're going, okay, this was that. And this is what this reads. And you, you sort of know what you're dealing with. In the pyramid, something happened to me. I had this in Gebek, Epi. I had this in the... Um the Byzantine underwaterways, what's it called? Uh, in Istanbul. I had this in Rome. The Colosseum and Julius' grave. Um, and I had it in various other parts of the ancient world. Um, but in the pyramids, something, I, I just had this flash on the wall. There were archaeologists trying to, you know, figure out something or studying the granite on the walls. Um, and mm -hmm. I, I, I just walked by and I was thinking, what are they doing? Okay, whatever. So I looked at the wall and then all of a sudden I just had this flash and I just saw white light, like painted walls and a woman in a white dress, you know, a woman in a white yeah. dress with gold. And I, and then it went, the flash lasted like two seconds. And I thought, oh, wow, did I just see something from... <laughs> You know, what did I see? And then I looked at them and they were still looking at the granite. And I was thinking, wow, it's not just about what's there physically. What if the answers mm -hmm. are, what you feel. Yeah, are beyond physical? And certain mm -hmm. people, only certain people can access that. When, when, you're, when you realize that the world isn't just physical, it's more than just physical, maybe you'll get more answers. So me, yeah. without my, you know, tools and what have you. I was just there and I just saw something. It's like, okay, did I just see something? It's really interesting. It, 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 it certainly does happen. And I mean, it's not all physical. It's not all scientific. No. Um, I, I, the Egyptians were strong believers in that. Yeah. Um, uh, Shuba. Hi. Hi. <laughs> um, yeah. So the Egyptians were strong believers in that um, and I just like you said when you were at the tomb of Julius Caesar and you cried yeah um, 
when I saw the body of Ramses II, I cried and cried and cried. <laughs> um, like they must have thought, yeah, then, then the people around me must have thought like, who is this fruitcake? Um, <laughs> because I was standing in front of his body yeah. for literally like 10 minutes and I just stared and I was crying. Yeah. Um, they probably and then I went I back. Sorry? <laughs> they probably thought, are we scaring him? <laughs> <laughs> so I went back again then with my friend Sharon and then we were standing there and we walked around and like whenever I've seen his body three times, when I go there, I get like this, like my heart starts beating. And then when I saw his body again, after a whole year, I was like, I just stared at him and I cried again and... Yeah. Oh, wow. That's so interesting. What did you... Curtis, may I ask your thoughts on ancient Egyptian engineering, for instance? Do you think pyramids are much older? Um, <laughs> no. Um, the pyramids were built by Pharaoh Khufu. Um, and people try and say that the weathering on the pyramids and on the Sphinx makes it older. But actually, when you have sandstorms, there's little particles of sand and those are impacting onto the stone. The stone is not very strong. Then when it rains, because they do get rain, those little bits break off and it actually looks like water weathering. So anyway, yes. <laughs> I read yesterday, I read... Um, uh, Hi, I'm an Egyptologist. You might know me better for my greatest hits. Um, no, it's not like Indiana Jones. Um, or my other hit, um, no, slaves didn't do it. Or my biggest hit, it wasn't aliens. <laughs> I, I wanted to ask about that. What do you think about people who believe that the pyramids were made by aliens? You know, I am not someone to dismiss someone else's views. Um, I'm very for having people have their views. So I let people, if they want to believe what they want to believe, um, you know, it's not an issue for me. Yeah. Um, I learned my lesson because I once had a three hour argument with someone um, who was like, giving me all kinds of research and things like that. And I had actually had a geologist at the table with us. And he also backed up what I said about the sand with the rain and that's the weathering that we're seeing. But this conversation went on for three hours. It was like insane. Wow. Was he very adamant that they were built? Very adamant. And this, this guy actually lived in Egypt. Mm -hmm. um, like three years um and he i mean for someone who lived there he had some very weird ideas yeah um talking about like fossils around the pyramid i'm like well it's built out of limestone fossils are found in limestone yeah he's like no the pyramids were underwater i'm like okay <laughs> to back up what he was saying um, the geologist was more on my side because he'd also studied these things. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. <laughs> it was interesting, but I'm not one to dismiss people's views if they like believing that then until they have the proof, go for it. Yeah. yeah that's yeah. in terms of proof. How do you prove the things that you feel that aren't physical. Mm -hmm. If you can't provide physical proof, how do you back that up? Exactly, exactly. I mean, people just make intuition. When I spoke with um, Sophia last week, mm. she was saying like Flinders Petrie, when he was finding the Fayoum mummy portraits, yeah. he gave some weird descriptions and he literally just described the entire person's personality based off of their mummy portrait. Um, which we can never know if that was their personality, but that was his perception. 
Okay. What, what was his so, expertise? I mean, there was one, um, I believe he looked at one, and he said, um, young woman who believes that she was very beautiful, but actually she's just okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, young man trying to find wife died unhappy. It's like these kinds of explanations. <laughs> Maybe he was getting some sort of vision. Maybe he made it up. We don't know. Oh, that's, yeah. That, that's the thing. Without physical evidence, yeah. you can believe. Um, but a lot exactly. of people, well, they did have spiritual beliefs that were beyond the physical, like, journey to a place. Um, and the experience that they would have compared to a Western archaeologist would be completely completely different because the that's the thing there are so many the culture was so different mm. Mm. it was yeah. so maybe yeah. they're not finding answers because the answers aren't physically there you know but then again, we're, we're thinking of it too much how we would do things today yeah yeah, yeah. it's like um john roma he tries to describe the the rituals happening inside a an egyptian temple mm. But he kept making the mistake of trying to explain it from a Christian point of view. Mm -hmm. So he would explain like the priest and then the Pharaoh would come in and they would burn incense and do these things. Um, but an ancient Egyptian temple was totally different. It was only a select amount of people that could go in, a select group of people. Um, it wasn't an open church. I, um, and he, he described it like a weekly thing where people would come and that's not really how it was, you know, he, but he tried to make it understandable. He knew it's not how it is, but to get people to understand, you had to explain it in our sense. <sighs> yeah. So, you know, things are interesting, but I want to know, what is it about different cultures and learning about different cultures that really interests you? I love it. I just, I love, I love celebrating our difference because that's what makes the world so unique and so beautiful and so colorful. You know, if yeah. everyone was the same, it would be boring. Um, and it would be so boring. Yeah. I mean, why would you want to live in a world where everyone's just happy of you? Mm -hmm. So it's 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 just so nice to learn about traditions, different rituals and cultures and customs and eat different food, learn different languages. I hear lots of these different. Acts. When when you go to a different country, mm -hmm. um, do you enjoy to eat their other food? I mean, for me, when I go to a different country, I want to eat what those people eat. Exactly, I'm the same. I want to live mm -hmm. local. I want to go out with a local to a local, you know, a, a restaurant or cafe or what have you, and just try the food that they want, that they like, that they yeah. that they eat or that they they drink. Um, and so I always ask the local, what do you like? What does everyone like here? What's the most popular dish on the menu? Um, and then you can't go wrong. You get a flavour and an experience, an authentic experience of that place. Um, mm -hmm. and yeah, I just, that's, why would I want to eat chips in Egypt when I can get it here? <laughs> exactly, exactly. I feel so much the same. There are so many South Africans that go, um, on a holiday, mm -hmm. um, and they literally are like looking for, where can they get like a burger or where can they get that? I'm like, no, 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 no. When you go to Egypt, you go somewhere, you eat the falafel, you eat that, you eat that, you eat that. Yeah. What they eat because then you'll understand it better. So good! It's so good. It's bad for you, but it's so good. <laughs> like I tried. I tried. Well, actually, I'm like kind of hooked on it now. Um, we went to the Nubian village in Aswan, oh, wow. which you have to go to. Yeah. I, um, I will arrange for my friend to find exactly the restaurant. They did like a a camel like a camel casserole kind of thing. Oh, wow. Okay. With this rice with like bean sprouts in it and the bread and the tahini paste. 
And I'm telling you, that's like the best thing I've ever eaten. I'm hungry. <laughs> I'm hungry now too. <laughs> but Shane, I went to I went to a lady's house for dinner on a trip to Egypt. Mm -hmm. Um and I was now expecting like traditional Egyptian food. And I arrived and she's like made mac and cheese and Fina schnitzels and things. And I was like, well, what's going on? She goes, oh, I thought you wouldn't like our food. I'm like, what? <laughs> yeah, in, in Cairo, the um, Egyptian woman I stayed with, she made me Egyptian breakfast in the morning. And mm -hmm. the food, I was like, oh, wow, this looks good. How am I going to finish this? You know, it, <laughs> it, it's just delicious. We sat around yeah. the hall, me, her, and her partner, and we just... Yeah, it was nice. It was nice to... Have you, have you tried mulukhia? Have I tried what? Mulukhia. I probably did. I forgot what that was. It's, um, <laughs> it's uh, what's the word? Lucerne? Um, there's another word for it. I'm not getting the word now. Anyway, it's like this green herb. And then they, they mix it, they crush it down and mix it with a little bit of salt and garlic. And it becomes very slimy. Oh, wow. Um, I wasn't a big fan of it because it's very bitter, but apparently it's super good for you. Do you know what the health benefits are? Um, like sinuses, it cleanses, like has like antibacterial it's very good for you oh wow okay good i think i need that yeah you should try it next time you go let me know what you think make a whole video testing it i will <laughs> i will <laughs> but um you know so i believe you do want to spend more time in egypt yes so me and my partner are living in um well in london at the moment and next year depending on covid restrictions we want to go to egypt um and just spend a few months there you know yeah. traveling and experiencing the ancient ancient ruins and temples and pyramids and tombs and artifacts and i think i think you'll love i think you'll love doing that just want to learn as much as I can about the ancient Egyptians by being there. The best way to learn about a civilization is to be there, to be there, yeah. and it, to learn about it. Yeah, you, you can never stop educating yourself. You can never have enough yeah. education of a subject. So when you go, spend a lot of time, as much time as you can, at Saqqara and try and look at as many of the tombs and the mastabas that are there because the old dynasties, you learn a lot about their way of life from looking at that. Oh, I need to. You know, I'm so annoyed with the COVID because I would have spent at least a month there in March. Yeah. 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 It's, it's, no, I'm, I'm so over it as well now. Like... I can't travel anywhere. I want to go to Egypt. I want to go to Italy. I'm like, I can't do anything. <laughs> Something about a ticket to Egypt, but they allowing people in. They are, but there's a lot of restrictions. And for South Africans, we have to go into a 21 day quarantine. Oh. So uh, I won't bother until that's less. <laughs> Hi, Brian. Love you. Hi, Brian. Yeah, so if you do go to Egypt, I think that would be such a fun thing for you to do. Yeah, oh, there's just so much I want to do. I just, pff, once we're allowed to travel, definitely want to go to Egypt. And back to Turkey as well, because that's where Arsinoe died, Cleopatra Thistle. Yeah. And that's where I actually felt the most energy. Like, I just felt I'd been there before. And I picked up the language within a week. It, it, you, you should, you know, trace that and pursue that. And maybe, you know, you'll feel something 
Yeah, I, I felt a lot there, and a lot happened to me. It was really bizarre. Even in Gobekli Tepe, so Gobekli Tepe is the temple in the world. Um, yeah. Discovered to date. Um, I was, I was on a bus journeying from Mardin to Sarah, where Gobekli Tepe was. Um, and I remember being being completely exhausted from the heat, 40 degrees outside, mm -hmm. and I hadn't drunk water because I didn't want to use the toilet. Um, so I yeah. went to the temple, and I was I felt almost like I was I was prone to heat strokes. But something happened. So I got to the temple and was admiring it, and then again I had another white flag. I was in a semicircle dressed in white with people around me. I had royal garb and they were holding my hands and we were taking a few steps in, a few steps back, like in a sort of ritual dance around the temple or in the temple. And then I, and then, okay, what was that? Did anyone know it was just me? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you need to drink more water. Yeah, yeah, it was. It was bizarre, <laughs> but these things happened to me um, in very ancient sites. So I'm very connected yeah. to the ancient world, and I want to trace it. I want to find out. Well, you've helped me greatly, so thank you. So I will be that rapid to find out more. Yeah. And you have to film that journey. I want to see everything about it. Yeah, I will. I will for sure. I see Sophia has come on to the chat. Hi, Sophia. <laughs> yeah. It's the spirit. They're funny. <laughs> Maybe. Maybe. <Ooh. laughs> but um, so my last question to you is, yeah. you looked into Nefertari's role as the God's wife in the documentary that we did. Yeah. Do you think that it was a, a glamorous role that she had, or do you think it was a bit more intensive? I think a bit of both, to be honest with you. It's a glamorous and yeah. But it was intensive in terms of what she had to do, the ritual she had to carry out. And there was a lot of, like I said, there was a lot of political pressure. And so she held the power. So she had, in her graceful and way, um, balanced the two and performed. Yeah. With, with much grace so that she had the right enough the right balance of power the political influence because essentially that's what Ramon also used her for and he yeah. lifted her to that level so that she was able to yeah. um, she was able to influence and help him with his missions yeah I think she she had an intense role but she handled it well and I think yeah. he would have made as easy as he could for her. Yeah, and by being a woman and just the way she was described at the time, she just sounded so beautiful and elegant. You know, like she won the hearts of the people. She's just, she just, yeah. like, <laughs> thanks, babe. <laughs> She's so... Um, the live chat says we have 15 seconds remaining. <laughs> so... We have. <laughs> it cuts off. Yeah. Um, so I'm just gonna. Yeah, she she just she handled it really well. She was so elegant and beautiful, um, and she used yeah. political power in a very graceful way. Hi, Sarah. Hey, Curtis. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome back. It's great to be back. <laughs> we haven't seen each other in so long. I know. <laughs> Um, yes, so w w what were you saying last? Because um, it, it cut you mid-sentence. <clears throat> so I, I believe that the role of God's wife, Nefertari to Khan, um, was a lot of pressure in her part. However, she, she handled it with much grace and elegance and beauty um, because of just the way she was. She won people, heart, people's hearts over. And there was a lot of political influence in um, in that to assist Ramesses II. And that's why he would have uplifted her to that role. Um, 
of her by his side to help him and assist him and navigate through the political decisions that he was um, he was inundated with on a daily basis. For sure, for sure, yeah. I mean, she was at the one point the most important woman in the ancient world, so. He was. So I, I just believe you get there by the way you interact with people. And so if you're given a certain level of power, um, such as the God's Wife of the Moon, that's, that's, I think that's one of the most um, powerful roles a woman can have in the ancient world. And queens and princesses were given that role. Um, and at some point um, in the Middle Kingdom, um, it stopped, didn't it? Yes. That ship suit glorified the role, but then she became pharaoh and then king even. Mel King. Yeah. She wanted to be identified as a man in the way she dressed and carried herself. Um, but yeah, it was Nefertari. She was the first, wasn't she? Um, yeah. And the way she handled the role with dignity, elegance, and grace to diplomacy between worlds and nations. I just found that so breathtaking. Yeah. You know, me too. That's why why we did the film. <laughs> Great to by the way. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I, at one point, I thought it wasn't going to happen. Um, my laptop crashed. It was like going to be forever to get it fixed, but I got everything back. So. No, you. I think um, things like that will, will always happen when you're trying to get somewhere. When, especially if it means a lot to you, you'll always have some sort of, you know, obstacles in the way. And it's about coming them, how you overcome them. Because when you overcome obstacles on the journey, you appreciate that journey more because you put in more yeah. effort and more work. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, I wish you all the best of luck with your upcoming travels when we can travel. <laughs> and you too. I, I'm looking forward to seeing your future projects and documentaries and investigations. Like, I love your work. Thanks for really. Oh, thank you. Thank you. We need, to, we need to go to Egypt together and, like, explore, I think. Yes! Can we do that? Nigel, where are you? Nigel, <laughs> go together. <laughs> Hello from South Africa, Nevin, Nevin Lee. Hi, Nevin Lee. Lovely to meet you. <laughs> Hi. Hi from South Africa as well. Be prepared, we're getting storms tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. <laughs> Stay safe. Yeah. Anyway, Sarah, it was so great chatting to you. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Also, hard. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. Now everyone's on. Hello from Egypt. Yes. <laughs> Hi. My, my Mollum Art Gallery. Hello from London. <laughs> Hello from... <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I, I will... You were speaking? Oh. <laughs> Shall I let you go? I, I need to go and eat lunch. You're talking about that food made me so hungry, so. Me too. I need to cook lunch. <laughs> and my dog is staring at me like, where's my food? So. Okay. I shall let you go. But it's been a pleasure speaking with you, Curtis. And thank you so much. It was so great talking to you. And thank you for sharing your stories with all of us. No I really enjoyed it. And I hope we get to chat soon. So We will. We will. Thank you so yes. much. Sending everyone lots of love. And stay safe, everyone. <laughs> Bye.